Vitamins and minerals, you probably need the B vitamins. That's why many pollen subs have uh, yeast added to them for the, the B vitamins. Um, but, and yeast has been used for a long time, very successfully. I've used it for many years. Certain brands like better. And then when I ran my large-scale pollen sub trial, the two yeast formulations just to eat them. So I don't use yeast formulation any, any, anymore. I don't even use my homebrew formulation anymore because the, uh, some of the off-the-shelf ones outperform my homebrew so much better. Um, possibly vitamin C, possibly some other ones. We really don't know. Trace elements. One for sure I can tell you is zinc. That was recently published. Um, and and I, I strongly suspect the zinc, and I'd already done all the calculations for how much uh, trace mineral salt to add to get the zinc up, because zinc is a component of patellogenin. So if you don't have enough zinc, the bees cannot make patellogenin. Okay? So the um, zinc, uh, I don't have the reference for it. It was just published on the benefit of supplementing uh, bee diets with zinc. So probably want to make sure there's enough zinc in there. Uh, a lot of the Eastern Europeans are supplementing with cobalt, um, having uh, what they say is good results. Some of them are supplementing with iodine, and also uh, selenium. Um, if you're deficient, that's, that's a critical one. So, but there's other areas, like the Imperial Valley in California, where selenium is so sky high that some of the pollens are actually toxic to honeybees. And uh, so you, you, it has to be relative to wherever you, you, you live. So, and you can go to USGS and download the soil concentrations for your area very easily. You see if you're short in a nutrient in a, a trace element or, or not. So you may want to make a pollen sub that's different for wherever you live, whether you, you have enough of these trace elements or, or not. Because you give them too much of a trace element, then you poison them. There's still a ton of questions. <laughs> Left. The main one, what's that factor X? What, what factor or factors are missing that allow a pollen sub to raise more than one generation? Uh, these can, the nurses can steal from their bodies or pass on via the jelly from one generation to the next for two generations, then the third one they, they tank. Then amount to feed. Minimum 100 grams of protein per week. Okay, now that. If you have 50 grams coming in on natural pollen, then you only have to make up the other 50. You don't have to have 100% uh, feeding, unless you've got 40,000 hives sitting in one yard. Then, <laughs> then, then you've got to do the whole thing. Yeah, Charlie. Yeah, no, ten, a full, a full size 10 frame, uh, you know, 10 frame colony, 10, 15 frame, something in like that ballpark. Uh, a one pound patty at 10% protein is only 45 grams. People who think that they're feeding their bees by putting a one pound, pound patty on every couple of weeks, you're giving them an appetizer. One pound patty is, is not, especially if it's a low protein, 10% one. If it's a 20% protein one, you're starting to get to the right area. Yeah. I'm assuming that the bees will prefer natural protein. Can you overfeed them? Boy. I have a good friend named Keith Jarrett. I'll show you some pictures of his hives. Based on what Keith does, I would say no. Um, Keith, oh, maybe it's not in this one. I showed it last night. I don't think I put it in here. Well, let me tell you that. Keith uh, is in California. He feeds his colonies heavy. He feeds them maybe like up to 16 pounds at a time, at a time in his colonies. And when beekeepers are screaming in January just before almond bloom because they don't have enough bees, Keith goes out and shakes both bees by the thousands of pounds out of his hive and sells them to other beekeepers. Okay? How does he not end up with small hive beetles? He doesn't have small hive beetles in his area. Uh, yeah, it's a huge, well, I'll get to small hive beetles. <laughs> okay. So in answer to your question, can you overfeed? Based upon what I've seen with Keith's hives, <laughs> no, he creates these Monsters! I mean, it's just incredible. He he, has, he sent me photos of just going down a line of these hives, going to almond pollination with the hives cracked open. I mean, it's like bees you can't even believe, and it's just from all this incredible supplemental feeding. No noticeable detrimental effects. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I don't think I believe it's probably good for bees. Yeah, yeah, yeah big big fat bees are good. We typically feed about uh, two and a half pound patties, two and a half, three pound patties uh, of a 15% of a protein in, in our operation. That, uh, uh, about a, once a week, yeah, for a strong colony. No, only when it's indicated, okay? 
We don't, we don't put a penny in our hives, we don't have to. So if only when it's indicated to feed them. So all during the spring and through the honey flow, we, we, we don't feed palm cell, only in the late summer and fall. Maybe a little bit in the winter. If you are feeding, like right now, I took this picture two days ago. So we're going through a bunch of hives. We've already put one patty on there. We go back and take a look at it, and no consumption. Every other colony have completely eaten their pollen patties. We used to waste time trying to save these colonies. We don't anymore. <laughs> you just flip the lid. That is, just don't, don't waste your time. That colony's not going to ever go to almonds. So it's a really easy way of grading. It's either queenless or it's sick with something, but something is happening. But, but um, if they don't consume their pollen sub in the fall, that colony is, 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 is worthless. OK, preparing pollen sub. Easiest way is just to buy the pre-made patties. Yeah. Well, if there's natural pollen coming in, they don't like it. They won't, they won't eat it. OK? If you, wait, if you, what? Uh-huh. Nothing. It doesn't have American foul food. We, just, we, just, we eventually move them to a sick yard, but that day, we do nothing. We just leave them alone. What we'll do all the times is we'll stack them high. We'll stack them four or five boxes high. And what that does, by stacking them four, we, we never combine a, weak, uh, a sick colony with a strong, with a healthy colony. Okay? But we will combine our sick colonies, just stack them high. And what that does is it allows them to make a bigger cluster of bees. By making a bigger cluster, they can increase the temperature. If there's multiple queens, the bees will choose which queen they want. And a lot of those will just turn around on their own then. But we don't do any kind of treatment or anything. We just as long as there's no, no sign of foul But we don't hardly ever see foul bees anymore. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I just was wondering if some of these just got the nutrients. No, we, no we, we, we don't want them to get robbed out. So we, so, but we don't have a robbing problem. I don't know why that many people talk about. If there's a handful of bees in a hive, we just don't see robbing. The, those, the handful of bees will protect, the, protect whatever honey's inside there. Um, if you use the one pound patties, it's hard to put three pounds in a hive at a, at a time if you're going to do that. You can mix your own. You can use a hand mixer. You can use a machine mixer. Basic formula, protein source, some fats, sugar, water, syrup. And if you have natural pollen that you've collected, uh, that's good. Protein sources, these are some uh, common ones here. Yeast used to be very uh, popular. Um, we're seeing a lot more of the corn, corn gluten. Uh, oh, I took soy out of here this morning. I, I, um, I'll show you back to that. Um, egg, maybe another one, or whatever's local. So when I go to different countries where the beekeepers, like the beekeepers in Chile, they were getting paid $15 for almond pollination. There's no reason to put $4 or $10 worth of pollen sub in there if you're only getting $15 back. So they had to find a, a local source of something that was cheap. So different countries use different, different things. Um, soy, which was uh, used for many a long time, uh, there's a problem with soy. There's the two of the main sugars, raffinose and stachyose, are toxic to honeybees. It also has a trypsin inhibitor. So what they need to do is to, you have to get a, a low uh, sugar soy flour and toast it in order to uh, destroy the trypsin, trypsin inhibitor. Uh, whether it's the expeller uh, processed or solvent extracted, it tells you how much fat is in there. Um, one way to get around is to use the soy protein isolate, which the bees absolutely love. It's 95, 96%. Um, soy protein doesn't have the sugars or the trypsin inhibitor. Uh, it's a little pricey, but the bees, I'll tell you right now, they love soy protein isolate. Oh, it's banging over there. Hold it down here a little bit, okay. I'm going to tie this too. <laughs> there we go. I think you need to get somebody up here to hold it in front of my face for, in front of my face for me. How's that? Does that work? Test, test, test. OK. All right. Uh, many of the manufacturers have shifted to uh, uh, off a little higher, a little higher. OK. <laughs> to um, corn gluten. It's not really gluten, OK? Gluten's in wheat and rye. But they call it corn protein, corn gluten. Um, it's relatively inexpensive and works really well. So. Um, 
this is what one of the things I mentioned, I, re I recommended they look at in Chile, and sure, they, could get, they found out they could get corn gluten relatively cheap, and their bees are loving it down there. Um, then the question is, if you put in a coarse ground protein meal, the bees will just kick it out of the hive. They'll, suck, they'll lick all the sugar off it, kick, kick it out, you see it out in front of the hive. So it has to be ground down to about the size of pollen grains, so you're talking about 35 microns or so. I was talking to one of the manufacturers of, um, major manufacturer of bee feeds, and he says something like half of his cost is in the grinding. It's not for the raw material, it's just for the grinding to get it down to part of the size small enough. Um, dump in your crude protein, this is when we used to use, uh, we used this for years, root tech yeast. Um, put in some lipids, put in some sugar, natural pollen. Okay, make sure it's clean. When pollen is brought to the United States, a lot of it comes from China. But it's illegal to feed it to bees because it only has ex import license to be fed as human feed. Because if it's fed for bees, it has to be sterilized because pollen is a, is a really good vector for any kind of pathogen for bees. Not only for bees, but for any insect. And all these insect viruses and nosemas are not just for honeybees, they're for all bees. Now there's only one place in the world where you're gonna find two species of, of or honeybees living next to each other, and that's in Asia, where you have Apis mellifera and Apis serrana, both living there, along with all the other native pollinators. And if you collect China, pollen in China, you've just got a cross-section of every pathogen known to pollinators in China, where you have two species of honeybees living right there and everything else. You ship it over here, and you dump it in your pollen cell. This was a very popular practice in the early 2000s, just before we got CCD. Okay, I don't know how much was it, what, what we're importing. There's still a lot of beekeepers who are illegally using Chinese pollen today in their pollen stuff. I think it's just like the stupidest thing you can do. So I, I would suggest you, you not, not put in raw Chinese pollen. You wind up hurting everybody, not just yourself. You put that in there, you get a new strain of virus that evolved in China, put it in your pollen stuff, take your bees to almonds, they crash, then it gets distributed to the whole rest of the United States that year. In one year, you can cause an epidemic across the entire country simply because you are saving money on buying some Chinese pollen and dumping your pollen cell. Okay? One person can hurt the whole industry. And you put water in uh, Sausage mixers or mortar mixers work very, very well. There's Dennis Lohman, who's one of the he, uh, he sells, Equinox. Or you can mix it in a wheelbarrow by hand with a, a, a mortar hoe. Uh, you mix it up well, then we take uh, rubber or uh, plastic tubs, uh, put a little bit of corn oil in there to uh, make them non-stick, pour your pollen sub in there, put it on the truck, let it set overnight. Next day when you get out there, you sprinkle some sugar or some dry sub on a uh, hive lid or the, um, a board, dump it over, take a spade, cut it up in chunks, smoke the bees down so you don't crush them. This is important in the winter, I ran a trial of what happens when we crush bees in the hive. We didn't get any effect during the summer, but during the winter, it made the colonies go, go downhill. Put in your sub, and then when you put the box down, I lift the box back up, it just squishes right between the frames. That's how you get large quantities in. Now, with small hive beetle, that's a problem. I don't have small hive beetles, so I have not been able to experiment to figure out, and I'm really surprised that somebody hasn't figured it out. Maybe Charlie will come up with some way of feeding pollen stuff that makes it put a shell around it or a wrapper or something to make it non-attractive to the small hive beetle. So, okay, are you, I, I, I'm counting on you to come up with something on that because this is a, a big problem for people in small hive beetle areas. And generally, the bees do better if you also give them liquid sugar at the same time um, along with the pollen sub. Okay, that's the end of the biological and the technical stuff. Now, as long as we have time, I loaded up a bunch of experiments I've done in the last few years so we can go over uh, those there. So these are all beekeeper supported ones. First question I had is what the heck do bees actually do with pollen stuff when you put it in the hive? So I used, I used fluorescent uh, tracers. So I, bought, I went to a black light store and I bought a bunch of different fluorescent tracers and then put it in bees in cages to test it for toxicity to find out ones that uh, we're not poisonous to the, to the bees. And you can crush the bees in a uh, Ziploc bag, put them under black light, 
And I don't know if you can make out, each one of these has an orange label telling what it is. You can see that some glow much better than the other. And I will tell you from experience now, and I've talked to other researchers, whichever color you choose, when you run your experiment, the bees will seek out a pollen that fluoresces under exactly the same color when you, when you try to analyze the, the result. It is so annoying. I have to keep changing colors of pigment because the bees invariably come back with a pollen that also glows. Um, very frustrating. So I set up a, uh, a trial with a few colonies. Uh, I mixed the fluorescent uh, tracer in with the pollen sub, either fed them between the two boxes or on top of the hive with, with a rim. And then after they had fed that, I went out at night, I put screen bottom boards on those hives, picked up the hives, looked at the ground and the black light at night to see how much of the pollen sub wound up on the ground or in front of the hives. With the sub that I used, most all of it went, did not wind up on the ground. The bees ate uh, most of it. Then we took our forklift, raised the forks up, and draped it in two layers of black plastic and made a field blackout tent. I put one sun inside, and the others, and we went through all these hives then and took out every frame one at a time, marked down whether it was a drawn comb, a honeycomb, a brood comb, or a bee bread uh, comb. And then he, uh, Eric inside then looked at it under black light and, and to see if there was any trace of uh, uh, fluorescence on those. First thing we found out, none gets stored as bee bread. Zero. There is no glow whatsoever in the bee bread. Bees have no behavior to move pollen sub patty into the cells. Second one, none is fed directly to the larvae. None of the jelly glowed. Occasionally we see a little fleck in the nectar where apparently a uh, nurse be eating it, got a little bit of, uh, uh, of a fleck on their mandible, and when they went into a cell to get nectar out, it fell off in there. But we didn't find any inside the larva cells, and little, pat little of the patty was wasted. Then, we brushed a sample of 50 bees from every comb, labeling it what it was, and then marked them down, froze them all, and now we had 105 samples with 5,000 bees to crush to see what the distribution among the comb uh, was of the, of the pollen sub that they ate. You all with me so far? So I designed the crush of bee. So I printed off grids of, of 50 crosses on a piece of sheets of black paper. You could take the frozen bees and lay out 50 bees, put the, pull off the wax, the uh, saran wrap off the roller, drop the mason light on there, and I had happened to come up years ago with, the, with this brass roller, brass cylinder that you could barely lift up. It would just sat there, and you can roll it with one finger, and you just hear it crash all the way across and crash all the way back. And when you pull it off, uh, the bees are all crushed, all the guts out of there. You can peel back the wax paper, and this is what you look like right here. So these look at all these bees, but you can't tell which ones ate the pollen sub yet, okay? But if you put it in a black light, it's really clear which ones ate the pollen sub. Okay, so then I could do this and count what proportion of the bees on every frame had pollen sub in their guts. You all with me still? So here would be a sample of, a, of bees taken from the entrance of a hive. Okay, so, so which is kind of surprising um, how much pollen there was in the guts of the bees coming from the entrance. Under black light, one little bit there, one little bit there. Not much pollen sub in the guts of the bees coming back to the entrance. Here's one from bees taken from the brood nest. And again, you can't tell by looking at it under visible light. Under black light, lots of pollen sub on the bees from the brood nest. So what we expected, hypothesized, is that if you, um, we put the patty right here, that we would have, and this would be the brood area in the hive, and you'd have honey up around here. We expected, and then I ranked everyone by percent of the bees with fluorescent tracer. So if more than 50% had fluorescent tracer in their guts, it was red. If it was down to less than 12%, zero to six bees out of 50, it would be this color. And I expected that the bees in the brood nest would have the most fluorescent tracer, and the bees in the um, outside, the brood nest would have less. Does that all make sense to you? The actual results look more like this right here. It was really surprising where they, where they were. This is for the fed in the middle. This is for one fed on the top. Uh, it had three and a half inches of honey right here. Um, not as much sub in there. 
And then a bear got into my freezer. <laughs> so I don't have the rest of the data for you. <laughs> Honey, pollen, brood. Okay? So honey, 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 pollen, brood, honey, pollen, brood, honey, pollen. Okay? One thing you learn if you start doing bee research is be prepared to spend a whole lot of meticulous time and then find out that something goes wrong and it's all just a waste of time. This happened twice so far this spring. I got huge amounts of data that are just wasted because the weather didn't cooperate or something went wrong. It can be very frustrating doing bee research. So then I was curious, what age bees? Because I saw this all over the hive, this pollen sub marked in their guts. So which age bees are, are actually consuming it? So I emerged bees in an incubator, and when they emerged, mark them with paint on the back. So I marked 600 bees, put them in the hive, feed the hive fluorescent marked pollen sub, and uh, uh, then I can squash, I took out 10 at a time of the, of the color marked bees, um, every couple of days, and you could see what they were. Um, what I found, none of them ate it the first day, 100% of them ate it the second day, and then it got a little iffy, so what I just got is a, a new scope. I got a, a, these are still in the freezer, I gotta go back, and it was, they, they started eating a pollen that fluoresced at about the same color, so I gotta get the black light hooked up to the microscope so I can get the rest, so I haven't published this yet. I, when I re-look at these samples, then I'll get the results on, on that. Uh, dry feeding. You can put out pollen sub dry, and the bees will avidly go right to it. They flap their wings, it gets in the air. They, when bees flap their wings, they build up an electrostatic charge, so the pollen sub and the air just sticks to their bodies. They comb it off, they pack it on their hind legs. You can see it all over their hind legs, and they fly away. They never actually have to touch it. They just only, if you make an enclosed area, and I've designed a couple of dry feeders where the bees fly into an enclosed area and the air is just full of it. They just fly around and they fly out there and comb it off and they take the loads back to the, the hives. When I did the math, when I went out there and measured in bee yards how much they would consume and then figured out how much a hive on the average in that yard consumed by dry feeding, compared to feeding a 70% protein pollen patty, their consumption rate, you can actually, with the dry ultra bee, which is the corn gluten, you can actually get more protein into a hive by, by not even opening a hive and letting them gather it themselves. Plus it has the huge benefit is that they store it as bee bread for long-term storage. Yeah? Have you ever taken a, a dry pollen and just put the dry over and over dry and just let the whole thing have it out? What would you get Yes, they do. <laughs> can you take it and just shake it dry into a comb, especially if you, if you mix it with sugar? And I've tried mixing it with fructose and with, with glucose. Yeah, so get the sugar content, and the bees will take it and they will make it into, into bee bread, okay? Now, we'll, but we'll get back to that. That's not the end of the story yet. <laughs> there are very clear preferences for the dry products, and I set them out for feeding preferences like this, and you'll have clouds of bees at one and, and they'll be ignoring another. And then you take the cup and just shift them like this, and in 30 seconds, the bees all move to the new location. They, they really have clear preferences on some. And it's not, some have a strong odor that I can smell with my human nose, if you grant me that. And, um, and other ones I can't smell. And the bees sometimes love the ones like soy isolate, which has no smell to me. Man, the bees just, just love that stuff. So then I went to see what happened. So I uh, made sure that I could put a tracer, I mixed a, a dry, a fluorescent tracer in here. <clears throat> Make sure that you can see the bees glowing when they, when they left it. And to see whether they packed it in the cell. So this is a comb that from a, a hive in the yard. I fed the dry sub for one hour in that yard. Pulled this comb out, put under black light. Okay, they bring it right in and they pack it in. They start making bee bread out of it. If you look at under the scope, the bright yellow is the pollen sub, and these are natural pollen grains. So they just mix it right in with pollen grains and they ferment it into bee bread. <clears throat> so then I asked Kirk Anderson at the Tucson lab, I said, Kirk, the question is, is it any good when they ferment it? Is it actually nutritional? So he will, his student will be pre presenting 
at the California State Beekeepers were the results of that, where they actually did cage trials then to see how well the bees did, how much protein they got out of it, and how well they did. The, the heads up I've gotten is that there were issues. The other thing I found, let me see. Okay, it's really easy. You don't have to open a hive. These feed themselves. They do store it as bee bread for later use. Huge differences in uptake between hives. Some hives in the yard will just brood up and look really good. Other ones won't even touch it. So it's, it's inconsistent in, in the yard. And it may not be as beneficial once it's fermented for, for the bees. Yeah. So uh, the same thing with the amino acids. And depending on where you are in the country, uh, they may or may not need so much of this, a little bit more of that. With the dry feeding of these products, would you also say that that might shift or change as we move across the country? I don't know. I, I, I've only tried it in my, in my yard. <laughs> yes. But like last fall, we fed a ton of, of dry sub out. I made a five, converted five gallon buckets into a special feeder. Went through a whole bunch, Charlie would have been proud of me. I went through all kinds of designs on it. Came up with a really slick one. And then after that, Kirk said, well, you know, Randy, I don't know what's the best thing to do. So they're sitting there now. Yeah. That was all outside the hive. I never even occurred to me to try it inside the hive. Yeah. Was yeah. there an extra pollen coming in also during the dry feeding? I can't seem to dig it. Mm -hmm. I can't seem to get my bees. That's all natural pollen. Eggs, that's the same kind right there. This is, this is showing from those combs where they mix it right in with the natural pollen. Yeah. yeah. They, if there's much natural pollen, they don't like it much. If there's a dearth, they like it a whole lot more. But they'll still bring in something. Okay, yeah. So there's issues with having the dry feeding. Would you suggest not doing that? Because it's not good. If there's issues with dry feeding, would I suggest going with patties? I don't make suggestions. I give you the research, you make your own decisions. How's that? Many other issues with Kirk's research so far besides not feeding my bees. No, and I need to actually go over that research with Kirk. We may, we may repeat it again. Kirk's very methodical and meticulous, so we will. We'll get a good answer for this one eventually. It may not be in the first year. Okay? Uh, I did not feed syrup at the same time. My guess is it probably would have an effect. Okay? Yeah? You did a mixture with sugar? No, that, th that stuff there was not mixed with sugar. Oh, okay. Okay, if you were to put it into a comb, you wouldn't want to mix it with sugar. So when the bees added liquid to it, it would ferment properly. Okay, but that's, I have not done extensive research on that, okay? But I know uh, talking to the guys in Chile, they do that often, and they say they make it into bee bread. That one over here. Yeah. I try to. I try to always put dates in there. Oh, wait, wait, thanks, uh, Kim. When I write my research, when I put the, 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 t the time of year, I put it in there. I try to put as much of that information in as possible. I usually, I try to put weather graphs in. I try to put everything that you need to know so you can uh, do it for your location. Because it's like the chicken stuff makes a whole big difference to me. If I can't get in there, it's just like everything else. Right. And so I have to figure out what to do when I see a, a show of pollen in uh -huh. Maine, Yeah, and, and that's why I don't give suggestions, because I have no experience with beekeeping in Maine. Yeah, yeah, but what I, I will, I, I do try to put as much information as possible in, in there. And if you ever have questions, just ask me. Okay. One of the things in the in the um, in South America, Mexico, and and Spain and Portugal, there is a horse supplement called Promotor, and it was uh, Promotor, a horse su supplement. It was a, a soy protein hydroxylate where they use it acid to break down soy protein into its amino acids, and they sell it as a nutritional supplement for horses, okay? Beekeepers started using it, and now there's two brands, uh, one called Api Promotor for bees a from Apis, the other called Promotor L, used widely by beekeepers in those Latin countries, okay? So the guys down in Chile, man, they just, they were spending a ton of money on this stuff, so I said, well, tell you what, let me look at the ingredients. So we looked at the ingredients. We said, this was like 11 o'clock at night at the table. Pulled out the spreadsheet. We did a calculation. I said, well, yeah, you're getting amino acids, but you're paying seven times as Because one guy was using egg, eggs for protein. The other guy was using the promoter. I said, you get the same amount of protein for one-seventh the cost 
by putting in, I said, what's, what's your cost of eggs? What's your cost of this? They're seven times as much to get the same amount of amino acids in from this, and this was way deficient in one amino acid. Okay, so when you calculated that, it's limiting amino acids. It made the eggs much, much better. Okay, so um, the problem is, if you look at how many grams of amino acids there are in 1,000 milliliters, you're only getting, if, at the recommended dose, which is 15 uh, mil, uh, milliliters per two liters of syrup, two liters of syrup is a, a half a gallon, you're only getting two grams of amino acid. That two grams is, we're talking, okay, so then I want to know which pollen subs on the market performed best. And this was published in the, it's, it's on my website. We set up a, a large yard uh, in late uh, August when things dry up in California. Uh, tested uh, nine different groups. So we had a positive control of natural pollen. I bought uh, bee collected pollen from a beekeeper from the foothills, so it didn't have any pesticides. Um, got that, uh, sent it to a manufacturer, uh, 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 Man Lake. Stuart was generous enough to run it through his equipment and make it into identical patties so I could use that. Um, and then I had a negative control, whoops, that we fed no, no protein to at all to see. This is a test of the experiment. Any good experiment generally has a positive and negative control. Then you can compare your results to either of those. <coughs> um, then I, uh, 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 Stuart was generous enough for all but one to mix up all the formulations that I wanted. And then uh, one other manufacturer didn't trust Stuart at all. So uh, he, he <laughs> had a hard time getting his. Uh, he sent one. So we tested Mega B, uh, my homebrew formula, B Pro, uh, Man Lake Bulk. Uh, which is sold in 45 pound uh, boxes for chopping up. Um, uh, uh, experimental yeast based one with a different yeast, and then uh, feed bee uh, there. We set the yard up like this. We used uh, cinder blocks to make landmarks to separate each group. Um, so, they, um, uh, and I didn't care about drifting within the group because we're looking at the groups, but I wanted to get groups separated here. Uh, fed palm patties continuous throughout the trial. Fed sugar syrup almost continuously. Uh, got visited, surprise visit, the head of uh, President of Mondia, the Worldwide Beekeeping Association, Gilles Ratia, stopped by to, to say hi. Um, this is a picture he took uh, from up there. He's crazy for taking uh, photographs. Lots of work making sure that every colony got the right feeding of the right patty and the same sugar syrup and, and over months here. They, uh, I used an apivar strip to make sure that the uh, that varroa was not an issue, and they uh, they gobbled up those most of the patties. We ran it till September, and I was getting worried. I couldn't see any difference between the groups, okay, except that they weren't eating the yeast patties. The yeast patties they did not like the yeast patties either one of them. And then finally in October they started to uh, grow. Started uh, these colonies started growing, growing up because they all started at five frames, equalized at five frames of bees. By November, when we graded, this is what the brood looked like in the negative control group. The brood was shot. There were no young larvae, no eggs. This colony was going to go into winter in really bad shape. So these are the negative controls. These would be the un unsupplemented. They fed sugar syrup, but no protein. Okay. This is one of the uh, uh, better pollen subs right here. Look at the difference. Big patch of brood, lots of young larvae, lots of jelly in those larvae. This colony is going into winter in really good shape. A bunch of young bees going to be hatching out to be your winter bees. So I said, man, I'm going to finally see some differences here. Then we moved them to a lower uh, winter low uh, elevation, carefully looking on the map so there wouldn't be any alder trees within flight range to get uh, January pollen. I had no idea how far the bees would fly <laughs> to find alder trees. Um, what they did have is a ton of bee bread. But what we saw is with this bee bread, and uh, we've seen this for several years, we could never understand why this fluorescent orange bee bread, the colonies would all go downhill with, with all this bee bread. And I look under the scope, and it looks like this. And Eric Muss and I, when we had, were looking at CCD, when he was a Nozema expert, <laughs> Something he said, Randy, what are all these fried eggs in all these sick colonies? And I said, I don't know. We, we asked other researchers. Nobody knew what the fried eggs were. So same thing. We got these fried eggs in, oops, in here. And I put out the word to researchers all over the world. And finally, one guy from Spain said, Randy, look up Euromyces, the rust fungus on the blackberry rust, which has been invading California. And sure enough, 
the rust fungus spores. There is zero pollen in the speed bread. Zero. My colonies right now look just like this. Like this, zero pollen. When I looked at the research done from the Tucson lab some years ago, where they fed different kinds of pollen to bees in cages, feeding them rust fungus spores was worse than feeding them nothing. It made the bees die faster. So I finally solved the issue of why my bees go downhill with all this, what looks like uh, bee bread in there. Yeah. Yeah, they eat it. But if you put bee bread, if you put pollen sub on top, it turns the colony around. If it's a good pollen sub. Okay. That's blackberry, but this is a fungus, a rust fungus on it. The rust fungi have learned how to trick pollinators. They make a fluorescent color that, it, that the bees' eyes pick up under ultraviolet light, and they put a little sugar in it, so the bees will gather it and transmit the rust spores from one, from, do cross-pollination of the rust spores. You have to have multiple sexes in, in, in fungi, okay? So this is to the fungus advantage, the bees' disadvantage. So then during the winter, I didn't want to overload these guys with liquid, so I started feeding them dry uh, sugar, which is commonly used in California, fed dry on the top to, to stimulate them. Here's the, you can see the pollen patties being eaten up. Uh, this would be uh, December 23rd, when they start brooding up on their own. There's no bee bread whatsoever, but you can see lots of fresh wet larvae on, uh, this was on the ultra bee. And then the alder pollen started coming in. The bees flew to the nearest creek, which was like four miles away, and started bringing in alder pollen. Now, somebody asked me earlier about maple and stuff. If you look at any bee book, it says, oh, the tree pollens are of poor nutritional value. And I checked it, and every bit, it was 100% alder pollen for a month. Because of the drought, none of the weeds grew at all, bloomed at all. So I checked every week, it was 100% alder pollen, pollen, no other pollens coming in at all. So the negative control group, which went into the winter in terrible nutritional shape, had nothing but alder pollen coming in. You with me now? I thought, wow, here's a test of alder pollen. And you can see that they stored plenty of it. And here is a negative control. This colony is down to one and a half frames of bees. And look at what... You tell me whether alder pollen is nutritious or not. Okay, so George Ayers, who writes for uh, Joe uh, in ABJ, does the, the, uh, the plant pages on the back. He said, Randy, we gotta change the books. <laughs> I said, yep, gotta change the books. <laughs> okay, this uh, clearly alder pollen uh, does just fine. We finally graded all the hives uh, at almond bloom. You can see the trees blooming right in here. And here's the frequency distribution right here. Of the natural pollen group, the, the red line in the middle, that was your average strength for all the hundred and whatever colonies there were in the, in the trial. Everyone in the natural pollen fed ones were at average strength or above. In the negative controls, everyone was at average strength or below. The chances of that happening by chance was one in less than 10,000. So that validated the experimental design. So I was really happy about that because I was wondering if, here was the final results, and these are on my website. We only got about a minute left. I want to show you one, one last thing here. Look right here. This is natural pollen. Oh, by the time when the alder came in, all the colonies took off. So the, the only results that were of value were here. But look what the negative controls did. They just went downhill. Alder came in. It took them a, a, um, a, almost a month to recover, and then they just started just growing like crazy. Okay. Of the zero of the colonies, negative trolls made it to grade for almonds. Of the top ones, uh, 17 out of 18 made it to almonds. It was a huge difference. But what I want to see is these two right here, these two products, took off like gangbusters early on and then crashed later on. There was apparently some limiting nutrient. The bees benefited from all the protein initially, but after... Okay, this is Liebig's law right here, that the growth of plants or animals is limited by the one limiting nutrient, okay? Once you supply that, then it'll be up to the next limiting nutrient. So something happened here that the, all that protein allowed these colonies to just take off, but when they ran out of that one limiting nutrient that natural pollen had, they went down below quite a bit from the natural pollen. So 
Even though these, so, so for short-term feeding, these are probably really mm. good pollen subs, but you would not be able to keep bees alive indefinitely on them because of that lack. Okay, we're out of time. <laughs>